Hi, uh, my name is David Morakshi. I'm a technical marketing engineer with Altium. And today we want to cover the concept of DFM. What does DFM mean? What does it stand for? And what is it used for? Well, DFM stands for Design for Manufacturing or Design for Manufacturability. But what does that mean for the engineer, for the designer who's using his EDA or her EDA tool to design their boards on front of the computer? It simply means as a designer, I want my design that I design in the digital domain to be transferable into an actual board that is manufacturable, one that works right the first time. While that's really feasible, we know that within our EDA tool, there is virtually no limitation to what we can do with them. Uh, an example would be, you can have any trace width, you can have any via size, and you can have pretty much any spacing between components. But that doesn't mean that your uh, manufacturer can manufacture the board. So that's what DFM is all about, is the art of engineering beyond the digital domain into the manufacturing world to ensure that your board is manufacturable, is right, is high quality, high reliability, and right th the first time. So today what we're going to be covering is two concepts. Uh, the first one is a simple question. Uh, which technology should I use, through hole or surface mount? And the second one is silk screen, how you can take advantage of the high tolerance in the silk screen to outline your design, your reference designators. So, but before we do that, I want to reference to this uh, diagram here. That that is, it's a study done by uh, Concept Engineering, and what it says uh, here in the first row, you can see, is a development process without DFM. And the second one is with DFM. And what it says that an upfront investment to introduce DFM early in the strategy, part of the strategy of designing will yield a 40% in time saving. And that's of course translates also in cost saving. And on top of that, it will also give you a long-term reliability of your product. And we know that field uh, failures are the worst. So if you can avoid that, that's always a win-win situation. And before we move on also, I want to clear the concept of DRC versus DFM. Uh, sometimes engineers, they think DRC can intercede for them uh, in terms of getting their board back exactly how they designed it. And while DRC can actually be a subset of DFM, is not really a replacement to it. Uh, to illustrate, uh, DRC can uh, catch like connection issues, for example, in your diagram. It cannot, uh, it cannot tell you if your pad is going to be thermally starved or you're going to have an acid trap, for example. Uh, DRC, if you have an, a short, for example, in one of the boards, all your boards will have the same short. Where DFM, if you have a DFM issue, for example, uh, some boards will have that issue and some boards will not have that issue. Uh, DFM issues do not manifest themselves throughout the whole boards. And that's the main difference between the two. However, with DRC, if you can craft your rules according to your manufacturer requirements in terms of via sizes, spacing, track width, etc., they can serve as a great subset to DFM. So let's move on to our first concept, which is through hole or surface mount. Well, this question usually it's not strategically asked early on in the design phase. It's usually like an afterthought and most of the boards usually end up as a hybrid, meaning they have through hole technologies and surface mount technology. And of course, we always recommend the surface mount technology because it dominated the industry since 1990s because of its high density and lower cost. Uh, but if you somehow end up with both, the one thing that you need to know is they require a um, different manufacturing process. Through hole requires wave soldering, while uh, SMT requires either reflow or wave soldering. So the obvious thing here is that if you use both technologies, it's going to increase the complexity of your manufacturing process. And of course, it's going to drive your cost higher and your time. So moving on to our first concept, uh, or second concept, which is uh, silk screen. We know as a good practice is to always have your component outline marked with a reference designator on the silk screen. This is really good for uh, post verification process and for the manufacturing process to ensure that your components are always oriented correctly and placed in the right correction. And of course, when there is a, a polarity indication, you need to mark it as well. So our first component we want to cover is uh, the chip component. 
uh, either a capacitor or a resistor, uh, maybe an 805 size. And I'm going to draw just what a bad example or a poor practice looks like and then uh, show what a good practice should look like. So here I have maybe like three chip component resistors. And you can tell me where, uh, how are they oriented, which direction. Of course, it's impossible to know. Uh, is it in this direction, this direction, or that direction? And when you have a practice like this, it always forces your manufacturer to use documentation and to increase the inspection of those boards, which ultimately uh, make your cost higher and your time longer to get your boards. And also you run the risk for them to have the components in the wrong spot or the wrong location. So as a good practice, it's always to have your outline outside your pads in this fashion and have your designator very close to your outline. Same orientation as the components as possible. And as you can see with the outline, you always want it to be a little bit far from the pad. And the reason being, if it's close to the pad, is on the pad, it confuses the stencil printer vision system. So that this is an example of a good practice. It's not the only one, but it's an example. And the next component we want to cover is uh, polarized caps. Uh, LEDs maybe and diodes fall in the same category. And uh, I'm going to draw here an example of a bad practice or a poor practice, if you will. So here again, it's very hard to tell the orientation or the location of uh, my polarized cap. I have an A here and sometimes uh, engineers will put like a diode sign. While these signs, they actually can help to understand the design, they really don't help with the assembly process. And remember, your manufacturer doesn't care to know where the anode is or the cathode. They only care to be able to align your component correctly during manufacturing process. So a better practice is similar to what we did with the chip component. You can put an outline around it and then have a bar on top to indicate the polarity. It's very obvious, very easy. And, or if you don't want to have the, do the outline, you can have a bar as large as your pad to indicate polarity. Sometimes uh, some engineers do would use a plus or a dot. It's not the best practice, but it's acceptable. It's okay. So the next components we want to cover is uh, an IC, maybe an eight lead uh, SOIC or similar. And uh, I'm going to draw again an example of what a bad practice looks like and then correct it with a, a good practice. So this is an 8 lead IC, SOIC. And as you can see here, it's very difficult to tell which orientation it is or where is pin number one. And when you have an outline also, the same size as the body, after you place or install the components, it becomes very difficult uh, for post-production uh, verification because you can't tell where the outline is and you don't have any in there indicator to where pin one is. So a better practice is usually to have a notch on top of the outline. And as you can see, I extended the outline beyond the body of the component. So that way it's visible even after the component has been installed. The other method is you can put a triangle next to pin one, and you can see it's far off from it, and it can be always visible even after you install the components. Uh, the other method is if, uh, if you have an outline already and you wanna just add where the notch is, you can just add it on top of the components, as long as it's obvious and it can be visible after the component is installed. That is it for us for today. Uh, we covered two concepts and uh, I hope you enjoyed the, enjoyed the video. Uh, please download the DFM guidebook. It covers a lot more DFM concepts. And please leave us our, your comments and your questions. We'd love to hear from you. And again, my name is David Morakshi and thank you and see you next time.